Welcome to The Kingdom, Saluna's podcast series featuring many blockchain use cases from experts across the globe, as well as insights from Saluna's leadership team. Enjoy the episode. Chris, nice to have you on, uh, on our uh, podcast again, or actually for the first time. <laughs> Hopefully Thank we'll you for you having here. me. We'll have you here again as well. And uh, Chris and I have uh, met, um, we met in person for the first time, although we've been sort of back and forth on email for some time, but we met in person uh, during the milkshake uh, sort of mini conference you guys held at your offices in New York uh, during the consensus conference right last spring. So that was yep. uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, it was good fun. And th thank you for being on that panel. So Chris, Chris heads up research for CoinShares, as I mentioned. Chris, why don't you start by just telling us what CoinShares is and um, what you guys focus on and, and, and your role there. Sure. So uh, CoinShares is uh, Europe's largest digital asset manager. Uh, we have a suite of uh, investment products uh, ranging from passive um, ETNs, where we have uh, Bitcoin and uh, Ether, Litecoin and XRP trackers that trade on um, NASDAQ, Nordic, and uh, it's probably the oldest one out there. It's been in the market since uh, 2015, I want to say. Um, the Ether one has been on market since 2017, around August time. That was also a first of its kind. Yeah. Uh, I think right now we have about $850 million under management, uh, which fluctuates with price. So, you know, mm. it's hard to keep track That's of it. Part. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and these are uh, so, institutions investing. These are institutional investors in the product primarily or individual. Uh, I, th I, I, I would say that most of our clients are retail at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. We have institutions dipping their, uh, their toes totally in, sense. but you know, it's, uh, the, the, on an institutional scale, these products are still quite small, even though we're, we're getting to a good size, but yeah. um, nice. it's it, for proper institutions to get in, you know, th this market in general needs to grow by quite a lot and add more liquidity. Um, you know, it, it, just imagine a pension fund getting into a $200 billion asset as like, you know, a, a sizable allocation, it would completely mess with everything. So. Yeah, no, I get it. When, it. when institutions start investing in this space, it will be an interesting phenomenon to see for sure. Absolutely. And there's definitely interest. Uh, yeah. we're, 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 we're talking to many institutions that have an interest in the space. And, yeah. you know, a, bun a bunch of them have concerns and they're sort of observing. And, you know, 2017 really caught the attention of a lot of uh, these institutions. So now this is on the radar. They're following it closely. Uh, right. But you know, they, they're used to having better information. They're used to having, uh, you know, higher research quality across uh, the asset or all the assets, including like the underlying industries, which is part of what we're doing. Right. So um, at CoinShares, I run the research desk and what we primarily focus on is educational research, right? For prospective investors. So we write, asset highlights that make investors comfortable with the underlying assets. You know, this is a lot to take in if you've never heard of crypto and you're, you know, you're getting into Bitcoin or, you know, even Litecoin or Ethereum, like crazy complicated stuff. Right. So we write comprehensive reports that go through the history of their creation, the structure of the technology, some of the new metrics you need to uh, be comfortable with to be able to analyze these new things in, in the context of just everything not being what it used to, you know, there's no PE, there's no, you know, the, the, nothing is the way it used to be. So right, right. None, none of the metrics that you're used to looking at uh, makes any sense anymore. So then finally uh, on top of that, we, we do, deep research into the Bitcoin mining network. Um, and so Bitcoin is our largest asset, probably accounts for between 60 and 70% of our total AUM. So it's natural that we go a little bit deeper into this one in particular. And um, we get a lot of questions about the industrial part of Bitcoin. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's getting better, but when we first started this about 20 months ago, there just wasn't really any high quality research um, mm. in mining. We had very few, the, the, 
we, we didn't even have any good sort of estimates of how much energy the sector was using. Uh, we had no right. idea what kind of energy it was using. And then, you know, you started getting these narratives floating around that crypto in general was not environmentally friendly and it's going to boil the oceans and everything. So we figured, you know, this is something that we need to look into. And then uh, as soon as we did, you know, we started asking questions to miners and they didn't, uh, they didn't really feel like they recognized the narrative uh, in terms of their own experience. I so, think. you know, th- we, we got the sense that something wasn't quite right there. And so we, uh, we, we dug deeper into it and, and this is why we decided to do these reports. Uh, so we, 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 we launched these like 16 page mining reports now on a, on a six month, uh, rotation. Got it. And so the one we're going to talk about today is, uh, zoomed in on the part of the narrative that is uh, focused on the type of energy that the, the, the Bitcoin and related networks are, is using, I, I would imagine. And, um, you know, I guess the narrative has been that the, the, you know, these cryptocurrencies use a lot of energy and they use a lot of dirty energy. And so you guys um, decided to go investigate as to whether that's true, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a half accurate statement. So yeah. uh, <clears throat> cryptocurrencies use a lot of energy. Uh, but w- the first thing to realize is that this is a feature and not a bug. So <laughs> the, the settlement finality of mine, like proof of work mined cryptocurrencies is mm-hmm. directly related to how much energy is, it costs to actually create the blocks. And the reason for that is that if it's expensive to create blocks, then it's also expensive to recreate blocks. So it becomes extremely energy intensive to rewrite the history of the blockchain. So therefore, as soon as transactions are buried uh, within a certain amount of energy, if you will, behind in the blocks, you can be very certain as a recipient that you now own those coins. So this isn't, this isn't some unintended consequence or something that just wasn't thought about or you know, something that we've just happened upon. This is what makes these things secure. So you, you, you have to start from, from that angle. And I feel like, you know, in, and in, in you, you can argue about why this is, uh, it's, it's probably a lot to do with competing narratives between, uh, you know, other consensus algorithms that purport to offer the same type of security as proof of work, such as proof right. of stake, which yeah. is they're not comparable and they shouldn't be compared. The fundamental uh, difference is that proof of work has been designed to be completely trustless, where tr- trustless, where trust really is irrelevant. Ultimately, um, you don't need it uh, uh, in order to confirm that an asset that you own, you really own, and yeah. uh, uh, energy and the, the uh, proof that energy has been um, dispensed to protect the network um, is part of the architecture of making that true. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, the, the sort of competing narratives is probably what has pushed this energy question to the forefront, if you will, right? right. So, you know, the, the proponents of the less energy intensive protocols are obviously going to go out there and attack the, uh, the more energy intensive protocols on that basis because right. you know, it's, it's their own interest. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, but at the end of the day, um, if it costs nothing uh, or very little to rewrite the entire protocol as it does under proof of stake, uh, they still haven't figured out a proper solution to long range attacks. Uh, which is essentially the reuse of old um, of old private keys that no longer hold coins, but that to an outside observer could look equally correct because mm. they don't know they're not on the inside of the chain, mm. right? So the the main difference is that if you want sort of certainty of ownership of assets and a proof of stake system, you actually need to trust someone on the inside of the chain, which you know that's that's fine and all 
um, that if you if you're willing to accept that as a user, that's up to you. Ultimately, um, my point is just that we we shouldn't be comparing the two because their merits are entirely different. Got so. It. It's it's not like it's not like we can switch Bitcoin to proof of stake and then keep the um, the the trust assumptions. That right. doesn't work like that. Keep the promises, the the vision of the network uh, uh, consistent and sound. Yeah, so correct. how did you how did you embark on the research that uh, you ultimately uh, put together on investigating the, this narrative further? Like, did you just get on a plane and go visit a bunch of miners and ask them a series of questions? Like, how did you go about doing that? So we started uh, with, so we, we have one analyst here at CoinShares that dedicates a lot of his time to this. And he started just digging around in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And you, you'll actually be surprised how much of, uh, how much information actually sits in the public domain. The, it's just that it's in the Chinese public domain. I think so. It's it's pretty hard to access uh, in the West. You you know it, it won't show up on Google. It won't show up using normal internet search techniques. Like you you have to search in Chinese and it, with Chinese um, search engines, and Interesting. you'll wow. get weird weird translations and um, and so forth. So you know the vast majority of everything actually comes from the public domain, and then we supplement that with interviews and mining forums uh, and chat rooms. Where you know uh, we yeah we ask around to confirm things and so it it turns into a public domain search which we try to validate through like a wisdom of the crowds type of approach. Got it. Which I don't know that there is a better method right now. You know, you know, funnily enough, like uh, miners are not very interested in talking about their own operations, but yeah. uh, many of them are quite happy about talking about their competitors. So, uh, <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah. So, so they know lots of things. They just don't want to tell you about themselves, but they can tell you about other people. Exactly. And, but the yeah, information and, I mean, is out there. It, it is actually, it's, it is hard to find, but a lot of it is out there. Um, and, you know, particularly in China, people are hesitant uh, because of the legal uncertainty and, uh, and, and all of that, which is challenging. But, I see. but um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. We, we, we've essentially been doing that for 20 months now. So we, after, you, after you get to a certain level, like when you set up a mine, um, normally you don't move it around. Uh, it kind of sits there. So we, yep. we, we can assume that if it was there a year ago, it's still there. Yep. Um, the, the notable exception being um, some of the miners in China, they're actually quite nomadic. They move around between uh, the wet and dry seasons, depending on right. power costs in uh, the Southwest and the Northwest. So, you know, uh, as we've built our database of miners, we we're, we get better and better visibility on, on where they are. And uh, it, it makes the, the the adding of new mines easier i see but right. but it's it's pretty backbreaking stuff um, it's it's just hard grueling research over time and only I, I i would say that our recent may report is 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 the i mean obviously it's our best one uh <laughs> they get better and better yeah, uh, yeah. but it's 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 the Perfect time. Craft, where, huh? Yeah, no, exactly. And, yeah, yeah. and and it's it's the one where we felt like very confident in in our assessments. And even though it's not provable to the T, like we are very confident in it. So, you know, for our own it's good enough for our own business purposes. So that should say yeah. something. That's great. So what, what would you say are the key findings from that first, that first report? And I know it was, uh, you know, energy resource related. T tell us about that. Yeah. So we, we've done three so far. So the, the first one came out last May and I'd say that the main finding we found there was that the energy uh, estimates that were widely cited in the media uh, were generally way too high. Um, and the reason for that is that it was using um, sort of like a top-down approach where 
you you choose a mine like a mining unit and then you assume that this mining unit is descriptive of the entire market as a whole and then you work your way backwards from the hash rate estimate to oh, try I see. And figure out how, how much many units spent. I see got it well yeah yeah you you would yeah you would get an estimate of how many units are out there so yep. we we thought that was interesting but not quite good enough for our purposes so we do a, a bottoms up approach instead so we actually look into um, the production capacities of the producers how many units they crank out uh, their damage and destruction rates um, and obsolescence you mean of the time. machines mm -hmm. uh, yeah so some of them have pretty nasty breakdown rates, right? Right, right. Um, and, you know, some of them are, are thrown around a bunch, especially when yeah. they're, when they're they nomadic. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so we, we estimate, in, instead of doing it um, in the top-down way, we estimate it bottoms up in that we estimate the amount of each individual unit that exists. So uh, I think... I think our model now contains about 20 ish units. Um, some of which are, are just small, um, uh, different versions of kind of the same unit, with like a different, uh, PSU or like a marginal upgrade, um, on like the amount of chips or some many things like that. Uh, but then we estimate how many of them sit out in the market and then we know their efficiency. Um, well, we don't actually trust manufacturers on efficiency necessarily. We, we use third parties for uh, efficiency tests, and then we combine that with the total amount of units that we have uh, sitting out there. Then we add estimates for um, additional cooling electricity demand. Um, and then from there, we then arrive at the, the, the total energy draw of the network. So yeah. the, the issue with our approach, though, is that it's not continuous and it's not dynamic. You get two points a year on your graph. So I see. Right. The, right. the, the, the top down models are nice. The order magnitude dynamic. can't possibly change that much. Do you think it, does it change significantly between the, uh, you know, the progress of six months or something like that? D depends right. on what the price does. Right. So yeah. <laughs> good point. So, yeah, so I, I mean, what, what's interesting too is that the, effic the efficiency of the gear uh, gets about twice as good every year. Right. So even if price remained the same, you would expect the hash rate to double. Right. Um, so then when you take that and add price on top, then yeah, I mean, you, you could get a order of magnitude difference over six months, like Bitcoin does 10x over six months sometimes. Uh, yeah, 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 good point. Interesting. So yeah. Uh, so the finding was that the first finding was the amount of energy uh, in the sort of public narrative of, uh, that that um, that the Bitcoin network uses uh, was you know grossly overstated. There's there's less energy use than well. How would you characterize the amount of energy in your first or whatever is your latest report? Let's say and perhaps put that in context for folks. Yeah, I don't remember what the what our first estimate was, but um, our most recent one, I believe, is on the order of. Um, I, I actually have it here, but I, th I think it's around forty-ish uh, terawatt hours uh, yeah. annualized. Yeah, forty-one. Uh, so something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about uh, it's about like a four point one gigawatt draw. Wow. Um, so you know it's it's big. It's big. It's big. Yeah. It's pretty big. It, that, that's like a big power plant, you know. Yeah. Um, which is which is kind of cool, but but you know it's it's drawn <laughs> across the entire world. World, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's super cool. Um, then, our in, in our in our next report, uh, mm -hmm. we we wanted to we wanted to go a little further. So we we wanted to you know our goal was to try and figure out like where is this energy coming from right. and. We were struggling for a while because we couldn't get uh, provincial level um, energy production breakdowns for, from for China. Mm -hmm. uh, we just we just couldn't find them. Uh, so we finally had a breakthrough in I think Oct 
October of uh, 2018, where we actually got this data. And uh, with that, we were able to, um, to puzzle together. We, we had it for the rest of the world. We had state by state in the US and Canada, uh, and we had uh, country by country in Europe. So it's, uh, and, and we had in Russia as well, although that's not that big of a market. But so right. with the provincial level uh, energy production breakdown of China, we were finally able to use like our database of where miners are to make uh, an estimate of their renewables penetration in, uh, in, in Bitcoin mining. So we, we had a strong hunch that most of it was renewable because literally every time we talked to miners, they were like, oh yeah, we're only running on hydro. Uh, we don't know what this whole coal thing is about. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah exactly. We, we don't know anyone that runs on coal, right? So it turns yeah. out that there are there are people that run on coal. Um, yes, I, I, I've heard of them, and I've, I I haven't been thanks. there, but I've definitely even in the U.S. I've, I've seen miners. Yeah, well, although you know, coal is dying in the U.S. It's it's natural yeah. gas mainly, right? Yeah. But right. I I think part of this is that um, I don't know if you remember that uh, Bitmain mine in Ordos in Inner Mongolia. It, mm -hmm. it yeah. got so much publicity at some point. You know, every reporter was there and showing pictures of this like insane new industrial thing, and yeah. that was that was run on coal. So then everybody was like, uh. oh. Uh, right. I think we'll, oh. yeah, we'll just assume that all of them. Every, uh, everyone's doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is not the case. So, uh, and, and so we, we, we did a little bit of more digging on this and what we found was that it's, it, it's not that we think that miners care particularly much about what their uh, energy source is. It's just that fossil fuels are generally too expensive. Uh, and the, the, the only exception is these types of brown coal um, power plants where, you know, you dig a giant hole in the ground and then you put your power plant like literally right next to it. So you have no transportation cost. And then you just dig out the coal, chuck it into the, the power plant and, and you, you get a pretty, pretty cheap price. Right. But other than that, we found that almost all the miners were setting up near renewables operations where the offtake of the renewables did not match the potential output. Uh, so what you so get- like Curtailment issue. Exactly, exactly. So in our second report, we, we, went, we went a little more deeply into this and we looked at curtailment uh, within China and mm -hmm. we found a, a strong pattern of Bitcoin miners setting up shop in provinces where curtailment was quite high. Mm -hmm. um, what we then also saw that uh, was that in certain provinces, particularly in the Southwest, where there are a lot of miners, you have huge curtailment of hydro. So uh, we, we found a couple of reports by Reuters that suggested that um, between uh, Yunnan and Sichuan, and I can't remember the last uh, province, between those three provinces, uh, that all feed into the Yangtze River. There's about 100 terawatt hours annually curtailed from the hydro plants because the capacity is just enormous and the, wow. the offtake just isn't that big. And uh, Bitmex research actually did a fantastic report on this a couple of years ago where they talked about how the overinvestment by the Chinese into power production assets it was a result of their policy goal of becoming the largest aluminum smelter uh, in the world, I see. which they which they did by far more than yeah. yeah more than twice as big as the second one, but they overinvested incredibly. So I see. even having reached that goal, they now have power assets, particularly in the southwest, which is not a great place of smelting aluminum because right. it normally comes. Uh, the bauxite comes uh, via the sea. So you nice. normally want to smelt your aluminum wherever you have super cheap hydropower, but on the ocean. Right, right. So um, they, they're now sitting on a bunch of, of power plants that are um, at huge overcapacity, uh, no, under capacity, sorry. Yes. And uh, miners are just flocking to them because they're getting prices that, you know, we can, we can only dream of in the West with the exception of certain isolated regions in, yeah. uh, in, in mountainous areas. Yeah. 
Interesting. So Amazing. yes. So so that so was did, that was did a, you sort of culminate into some kind of uh, quantitative view of sort of the the mixture of renewables versus non renewables in the yes in the market. Yeah. So so what we did was that we uh, we we essentially grouped our um, we we grouped our, our our database of where miners are located into. Uh, provincial and state level for U.S., Canada, and China, which are three very important areas in uh, Bitcoin mining. And then for the remaining regions, we used country level data. Then we looked at the um, the power generation spread in those regions. And we made the assumption that if you're mining in a state in the United States where 90% of power production is renewable, it is a fair assumption to say that you as a miner use 90% renewable energy. Right. So we did that um, and combined it with all the data that we had provincially in China, uh, United States, Canada, all over the place. And we then were able to quantify the amount of um, renewable energy that is used for mining based on our estimates of where the miners are comparatively. Got it. So uh, we, we essentially grouped it between like Sichuan becomes its own group because it, it's such a large uh, share of, of global mining. Mm -hmm. Al almost, almost 50% of global mining is there. Um, then there's a the remaining, you know, 10-ish percent spread around China, and then the rest is spread around the world, uh, normally in Pacific Northwest, Scandinavia, Iceland, um, Canada, uh, the Caucasus, you know, right, right, what, right. What, I, exactly where all the mountains are and where it rains a lot, like, yeah, where you know. The hydro plants or um, yeah. other types and, of... Mm -hmm. and, and, and now we're seeing, uh, we're seeing sort of entrance of the wind projects, right? So mm -hmm. we're seeing uh, entrance of wind projects, particularly in Texas, yep. which we, th yeah, we thought Texas was pretty cool. Permian Basin area or? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, we're, we're, we're pretty excited about uh, where we see this uh, development. But, um, yeah. Yeah. but essentially what we found is that uh, in our first report, we found that about 78% of Bitcoin mining is renewable and our latest estimate is 74 so okay. we'll see how it goes now in November. We actually expect a bunch of miners to migrate to uh, away from uh, Sichuan for from the wet season up to Inner Mongolia and Xinjiang for the dry season. Nice. And um, there, there's a much more heavy reliance on coal and wind. I see. So, so, so it, there's a seasonal it, view. So that's probably the fluctuation between 74, 78, or is it just other reasons well, I mean, that shift? you would actually you would actually expect it to be the opposite yeah but par part of what happened is that uh miners got booted out of oregon for example okay and uh moved to uh for example alberta okay. where there is hydro but there's mostly fossil fuels there okay got so it. there's you know it's, it's a fluctuating industry and regulation can have a pretty you know nasty uh, effect on it if it's done wrong and you know in our opinion this was an instance of it done wrong like you're, you're right. kicking miners out of an area where they're making very little um, climate impact and you're potentially moving them to areas where they'll be making a larger climate impact so this is you know the <laughs> obviously up to every local government and they, they, they have their own local concerns to think about and, right. and price levels and everything. Right. Uh, but yeah. So what's the, what's the, uh, before we move on the, one of the reports, I think it was your last one that um, kind of had this uh, summary that I think was intriguing. And that was this whole concept of, you know, um, looking at the world map and looking at, uh, the sort of renewable uh, opportunities throughout the world and sort of uh, uh, making the case that Bitcoin would create this sort of global uh, floor. If you pour a glass of water on the, on yeah, the yeah. sort of like, uh, you know, fall to the lowest point. Could you sort of uh, um, explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is um, imagery that I think originally came from Nick Carter. 
Uh-huh. And uh, he, um, he said that you could view uh, global renewable energy potential mm-hmm. as a topographic map. And if you laid this topographic map out on a table and right. with the deepest uh, crannies being the cheapest possible uh, production cost of renewable energy and the highest peaks being the most expensive, Mm -hmm. could argue that because Bitcoin mining is so location independent. Right. You can uh, do it anywhere in the world. Yeah, exactly. You just need an internet connection uh, and a road, I suppose. I mean, I guess you could fly things in on a helicopter, but you know, (laughs) it'd be expensive. That's very expensive. uh, But I guess. But uh, yeah, you you need such a minimal amount of infrastructure that you could view uh, Bitcoin mining demand as, um, you could picture it as a glass of water that you pour across this map and it settles in the deepest uh, nooks and crannies and it smoothens the entire map out. So Bitcoin miners will flock to wherever the power costs are the cheapest and they will take that off. They will act as a global cornerstone demand for Mm. uh, energy, Mm. almost no matter where it is. You know, it just needs to be stable enough that people are willing to take the risks and, you know, you need to be able to get there and hire, hire a few people. Right. Right. So this, we see this as a huge potential, right? So we see this as uh, a fantastic alternative, uh, just a private alternative to energy, to renewable energy subsidies. So instead of having to, take money out of taxpayers pockets to subsidize projects, you know, wherever they are, we, we now have an opportunity for a completely free private market mechanism to drive renewables construction, wherever renewables are the cheapest, right. then mining can then act as uh, a building block to get these projects up to the scale that is required for you to then connect it to the grid. Yeah. As soon as you then connect it to the grid, prices will flow up closer to that of the general market. Miners will probably be priced out and they'll move on to the next project. Yeah. So, and you know, this is, this is what you guys are doing. So. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly our plan. And one of our advisors used to call it this, the, the stepping stone model where you can imagine bringing in the mining infrastructure uh, as a way to finance the construction of the, of the plant and then uh, that plant becomes a new resource for uh, for the energy infrastructure of that location, and because of the 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 power cost and the richness, it also becomes a very powerful resource to add to the infrastructure, which ultimately lowers the cost of of power for the region. Um, it's a great uh, and exciting model that we're working on, and Morocco a great uh, place for renewables to to, to start our project. Um, and we're trying to do it at, at, at very big scale to show that, that it can be done at that level. That's um, I, we're very excited to, to to see this project move forward. Actually, it you yeah. know not only does it sort of like validate our own claims, but it would yeah. be awesome to yeah, just, to just like example. play out in reality. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, and that's that's exactly what we're planning. Um, what's your new report about? There isn't anything hugely new to. You know, we don't have anything groundbreakingly new like we did before. It's more of a, a, a gradual increase in the, in the precision of, um, of our database and therefore our models and also an update of, um, of the metrics that we track, which is, you know, the hash rate, the, the general energy efficiency of the, of the network and the, the total power draw. And then, of course, an update of the renewables penetration. So... Uh, it's it's more of like um, it, you know it's it, it's it's just a, a stepping stone, if you will. But can you can you offer any um, uh, predictions, perhaps, around what you're seeing from the from your research now as it relates to either energy or trends in China, maybe hard with the role of hardware in kind of how it will it will change mixture that sort of thing. Yeah, it's. Um, it's actually quite interesting. So I think we're, we're, uh, there seems to be consensus that we're approaching uh, commodification of hardware. 
um, yeah. which would probably, it, it, it would, it would make new business models possible and it would lessen the, it would lessen the importance of getting your hardware early in the hardware cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be interesting to see what this means for the development and energy efficiency. I mean, so far we've had a very consistent uh, doubling of efficiency every year. Right. Uh, so I feel like if we're moving, um, Essentially, what I'm hearing is that manufacturers are putting less emphasis on uh, moving the mask width of their chips down and moving uh, and putting more emphasis on optimization of their existing chips at their current uh, mask width. So instead of, you know, driving, I mean, look at how quickly uh, ASIC chips moved from like 120 nanometers down to the current is like seven, yeah. right? That took, that took what, like four years? That's that fast. That's probably... The fastest it's ever been. I, yeah, I, I mean, that that took the semiconductor industry like, you know, more way more than a decade. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and say. so mining caught up extremely fast, and it almost seems like uh, it's a little bit too fast. So what I'm hearing mm -hmm. is that a lot of the, a uh, lot of the 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 smallest mass width chips that have had tape out have have had pretty low overall. Um, efficiency a bunch of chips come out wrong um right. so there's now more of a focus on optimizing the ones that currently have and you know driving the the capex price down uh mm -hmm. so this now enables a bunch of very interesting uh business models like for example uh i've heard talk of um of utility utility like electricity utilities uh They've been talking about implementing proof of work mining as uh, a way to protect against brownouts, to, t to take off uh, excess capacity, like peak shaving in reverse almost. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and you, know, you, can, you can now think of if, if hardware becomes commodified and, and, and low capex, it's, it's a perfect way to integrate um, into you know, large scale renewables infrastructure, like in Germany, for example, when you have super windy days and, you know, power costs is, is negative. Right. Uh, if, if you had a ton of uh, modular proof of work miners stationed all over the country near these renewables projects, you have an immediate uh, takeoff client that will exactly. take that power and turn it into money. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that, does it? <laughs> so, yes, exactly. So, from electrons so, to cash, I like it. Exactly, it's <laughs> uh, it, it it's so amazing to watch. It's like hard to even believe it's real. Uh, yeah. And so, I mean, in in terms of overall global flows of miners, um, it's going to depend a lot, frankly, on uh, on uh, Chinese policy, right? If if miners get booted right. out of China, um, yeah. suddenly. Mining. everything changes right yeah you're talking about 50 percent of the network has to be redeployed outside of the, yeah outside of that country all of a sudden yeah yeah uh you know assuming they get to bring their hardware with them right right um so and we're also hearing of uh mid-scale movement into places like iran uh where right. power is very cheap right. but it is predominantly fossil driven uh natural gas yeah um there's also talk about uh, putting them in places where there's also huge amounts of natural gas. Uh, we heard uh, talks of Eastern Russia, uh, Eastern Russia, where the mm -hmm. pipelines come out for export in Sakhalin. Um, that, that would be a very interesting place. Uh, there's talk about Kaliningrad, the Russian enclave in um, uh, on the Baltic, which is also a pipeline hub. Mm. Um, so, I mean, Texas too is, is a huge is a huge uh, potential growth area. Uh, we, we hear a lot of chatter about using solar, and this becomes more and more viable the more commodified hardware gets and the lower the capex for hardware gets, right? Right. So right. Because you have these unevenly producing assets. If if your miners have to, if you're in a, if you're in a race against time and difficulty to pay back your capex, uh, intermittent production is not that um, 
interesting. Uh, you kind of need the steady hum of hydro that yeah. allows you to run at peak capacity at all times so that difficulty doesn't outrace you. But if you, if you get commodified hardware at a low cost where difficulty only gradually increases or, you know, increases more in, well, I mean, there's always price, right? Price will yeah, drag yeah. the difficulty up as it does. Right, but right, right, right. But it'll be bursts where, you know, you get, you get uh, footprint sort of getting added because the price movement is happening. Yeah, there, there's, yeah. A, there's an interrelationship um, we, we sort of believe. So you can't always just move one variable. But I get yeah, what you're no. saying. What you're saying is that, um, I mean, obviously, you've seen a huge improvement in, in, in the efficiency and uh, hashing power of ASICs over a short period of time compared to any other industry, the normal PC industry, let's say. No, it's been, it's, it's been a total arms race. And um, um, we, we, we actually do a calculation of the breakdown between... Uh, CapEx and uh, electricity OpEx. So mm -hmm. at, in our latest report, um, CapEx represented about 38% of the total cost of mining a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So as that component falls, uh, intermittent production uh, from intermittent sources becomes more and more viable. Uh, and, you know, 38% is, is lower than it was at our previous report. And um, this has to do with uh, a lot of uh, hash power uh, changing hands after the price crash in November, where a lot of miners uh, were liquidated. Oh, I think. Yeah, and they had to sell their units at, you know, sometimes a 90% uh, discount, discount on what they paid. Wow. Yeah, because a, a, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the units, especially the ones that are sold to retail, which, you know, are, are unfortunately the, the least savvy yeah. uh, in, in buying their units. Um, Bitmain in particular are very good at selling their gear at prices that correspond to your potential future income as yeah. the price of Bitcoin stands. So right. a lot of these people paid, you know, several thousand dollars per S9 and had to sell them for 200 bucks. So, Amazing. wow. So the, the, the current stock of, uh, of miners um, are, are sitting with owners that are much better capitalized than um, that they have much healthier balance sheets uh, with much lower uh, CapEx outflow uh, up front. So they have much less to pay back. Um, so I, I think it's a very good time to be a miner right now. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Well, yeah. I, uh, we've come to the end of uh, our time. I uh, really appreciate you spending the time with us, Chris. Uh, this is very insightful. And, uh, you're a great uh, re resource for uh, research on the Bitcoin and blockchain industry and blockchain computing globally, and especially as that relates to energy. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more from you guys soon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, and I'd love to come back. Pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Saluna, please visit us on our website at saluna.io.